Uh, we are back now, uh, so welcome to all who uh, have just joining us. We are having now to the third and the last session, which will be moderated by uh, Emily Burlar uh, from Idelux. Uh, it's yours, Emily. So welcome back everyone. In this session we are going to talk about the work of different partners on an important topic when we talk about drone innovation, which is semi-autonomous flight of drones. And first let me introduce Jose Luis Sanchez Lopez, who is a postdoc research associate and head of the Aerial Robotics Lab uh, of the Automation and Robotic Research Group of the SNT of the University of Luxembourg. Jose Luis, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, so I was saying uh, hello everyone and thank you very much for being here today uh, in this uh, final event. Uh, today I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, what we are doing at uh, our research center, it's been completely in our research group. Uh, that basically can be sum up uh, this, in this sentence from remotely pilot drones to autonomous aerial drones. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, what's the current state of remotely pilot drones? Uh, so nowadays, the drones that uh, one can find in a shop, a uh, commercial drone, they, they are basically formed by a platform. Uh, the area of vehicle itself, uh, it has a flight controller which, uh, which has some onboard sensors, uh, for example, a GPS or other sensor, for example, for some obstacle avoidance functionalities. Um, and then, depending on your concrete application, you can also put on board other sensors like a high resolution camera, a LiDAR, uh, etc., that basically collect the data that you need to acquire for this particular application. Um, normally, <clears throat> the concept here is that there is also a human in this loop that is really seeing, perceiving what the drone is doing uh, and sending commands via this uh, transmitter. And also, it's able to receive in some occasions some feedback from the drone, for example, the images that the drone sees. Some advanced, more advanced drones, they have some automatic functions where the human can actually send some waypoints so the drone can automatically go there. But this is only valid in some particular environments. So, Basically, what we have here in the current state of the art of remotely pilot drones, they have limited sensing, just a couple of sensors for some automatic functions. They have limited computational power because they have just a flight controller to do a very specific uh, task. They have limited effectors, so normally it's very hard to include a manipulator or something else to interact with the environment. And they are very dependent on the communication link. And this, then the capabilities that they have is that they have a limited situational awareness. The situational awareness is mostly acquired by the pilot. They have a restricted performance in different environments. So in outdoors environment, they perform better, but if we want to, for example, go inside a mine, then it's, the performance is really <laughs> diminished. Uh, there are some limited autonomous motions. Um, so of course, very limited planning, decision making and reasoning limited or maybe an existing full recovery and problem solvent and as I mentioned limited interaction with the environment and other agents and then they need also a human operator that has the role of a skilled remote pilot it has to be very skilled because it has to take so many decisions and to control the platform so what we do here in our research group is we provide these multi-rotor aerial robots with the highest autonomy level by the development of robotic artificial intelligence. And then we enable them to perform autonomously a variety, variety kind of missions in different environments and without human intervention. And you may wonder why we need this, why we need an aerial robot. Well, basically there are several reasons. Um, the first one is to simplify its use. It's much easier if it is an autonomous agent. So you don't really need to take care of that many things. 
also to increase safety uh, because it's easy that the human make a mistake, especially when the drone is flying far or maybe inside a cave, you can make a mistake uh, easily. Uh, to reduce also the cost of operation, you don't need any more a very skilled pilot, so it can be used by a non-trained person. It became more scalable, you can deploy fleets, imagine hundreds of drones easily because you don't really need the, this skilled pilot and the cost of operation has been reduced. You can also increase the range of operations so it can really fly very far because you don't need any more uh, the pilot to be in the loop. So the, the drone is able to develop the mission without the human being there supervising and teaming. And basically what we are able to achieve is to enable new application based on the three plus three Ds. So the three common Ds are dull, dirty and dangerous. Plus also these exterior, domestic and dear application. Uh, so basically the concept we, we developed in the group uh, is, okay, we have the same platform equipped with the same autopilot and why not with similar our sensors, but on top of this, we add um, other sensors that are useful for the robot intelligence, um, like a camera or a 3D sensor. We also add a powerful onboard computer because the intelligence has to run there. We can also eventually, if it is needed by the mission, add a manipulator or all of the effectors. And also in this computer for robot intelligence, we connect the sensors for the application and as well um, a communication module. Okay, so finally the, the, the aerial segment, the thing that is flying, has much more equipment on board than in the remotely pilot case. Um, then what happens is we have a human operator that is just uh, providing high-level mission commands, for example, uh, could be, okay, go inside the mine and inspect it. This would be the high-level mission that the human operator provides and communicates uh, with the robot, with the robot uh, using 5G or Wi-Fi or maybe in some puntual cases you don't really need to have a communication because the robot is autonomous, so you don't need to supervise it all the time, okay? Uh, the advantage on, on this is also that uh, the robot is able to understand um, the, how the, the mission is going and take decisions to correct it. For example, if the robot has to take pictures of a building and for any reason one of the pictures was blurry, the robot may be able to understand that this picture was blurry and take it again. Okay. Uh, so basically, we can summarize saying that uh, this aerial robot concept has an advanced sensing, has advanced computational power, advanced effectors. It's communication link independent. You need somehow to have a little communication, at least to send the initial mission goal, but you don't need a constant uh, communication link. The robot then needs to have a complete situational awareness because it has to be able to know the environment perfectly and to reason in this environment. It has to have a performance that is independent of the environment because uh, it will need to fly in different environments with the same performance. So it cannot degradate when it's inside the mine or when it's outside. It, it has to be stable in all the situations. Uh, it has fully autonomous motions, uh, autonomous planning, decision making and reasoning, for recovery and unexpected problem solving, and also, uh, why not, interaction with the environment and with other agents. And as I tried to mention, then the human operator becomes just a, a high level mission commander. So, um, to build it, and I already mentioned, we have the drone equipped with sensors, with computers, and with motors and effectors. Um, and what we do is we build on top of this the robot intelligence, which is so is the robot artificial intelligence that is formed by, let's say, four main capabilities that are the situational awareness, so uh, how the robot perceives the environment, how the robot 
constructs the environment and it itself in the environment and how the robot is able to uh, reason or to generate a, a knowledge that would be used to reason over the it. Then uh, it requires also motion control. So it needs to be able to accurately move uh, in the environment. And to connect these two parts, we need the planning cognition and reasoning. So knowing the situational awareness, we plan how to move, what we need to do, etc. And then we connect this with the capabilities of moving accurately. Okay. On top of this, uh, we have this other capability um, of uh, interaction uh, with the environment, with other agents, and to communicate with other agents. And with environment. And this, this opens uh, a big set of tool capabilities that need to be developed in each of uh, these big capabilities. And this is actually what we are doing in our research group, uh, building all these robot uh, artificial intelligence and all these capabilities. If we take a vision of uh, the system architecture where we combine these capabilities with the hardware, it will be something like this. So, uh, the sensors uh, are really going directly, the measurements of the sensors are going directly to the situational awareness capability. The situational awareness component is really building the situational awareness, this, this model of the environment, this model of the state of the robot, that then is used for both planning, uh, cognition and reasoning, and also to uh, perform this motion control to these accurate motions, okay? So the, the planning is reasoning on the environment, is able to, to know um, what is happening with the environment and then how to move forward, how to achieve the mission uh, and generate the commands for the, for, for, for the motion. There is also this other communication part. So to conclude my, my presentation, um, I just want to summarize in this table, the commercial uh, remotely pilot uh, aircraft has limited sensing, number of effectors, computational power, where the other robot has more advanced features, is dependent on the communication link, uh, and the other, the autonomous robot is independent. Uh, the commercial has a limited autonomy, uh, a human dependent operation, while the autonomous area is high, has a le high level of autonomy and human independent. And the capabilities, well, I mentioned already, the commercial has a limited situational awareness, environment restricted performance, limited autonomous motion, planning, decision making, reasoning capabilities for recovery and unexpected problem solving, and limited interaction, while the autonomous robot has all this, but in an advanced way. And more importantly, the commercial remote pilot aircraft requires a skilled remote pilot while the human, while the autonomous robot is just high level mission command. So that was uh, a little my introduction. If you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer them. Thank you, jo Jose Luis. I think I've seen uh, two questions. Well, three questions for you. Uh, the first question is from Hervé uh, from Central Supélec. Yes, thank you. Uh, so my question is, could you tell us a bit more about the, the artificial intelligence techniques that you, you have tried and used and just to know a bit more about this? Sure, uh, well, um... I include in this, uh, in this robot intelligence all, all these capabilities, situational awareness, cognition, motion control, and interaction. Of course, it's, it's each of the capabilities has different techniques. So, for example, I can tell you in motion control, we use both reforming learning, which is uh, machine learning based, but we also have other model based, that is, for example, model predictive control. In the situational awareness capability, we have computer vision with also machine learning, perception, uh, sensor fusion, common filters, maybe you know about it, um, SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, optimization. In terms of planning cognition, uh, we have also optimization, we have trajectory planning, path planning with many different techniques we have explored. 
in the part of communication and interaction, we have also explored natural user interfaces with advanced sensing capabilities, for example, to measure the human body in order to move the robot, also how to interact with other robots, uh, do information control or multi-robot uh, flights. So it's a little dependent on each of the areas. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for one last question, Henri Michel. Um, thank you. Thank you for selecting my question. Um, when I'm hearing about autonomous flight, I have two questions which are really far from the field. The first thing is when you have autonomous flight, uh, what are the security to avoid that someone try to hack and steal your equipment? Is there, have you developed such things? I don't know if it's possible, it's not my field, I have to say. And the other thing is uh, that two years ago at Brussels, uh, there have been a company presenting the possibility for uh, autonomous uh, docking station where the, the drone can be recharged and continue an autonomous uh, mission. Are you aware of the development in the field? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Very interesting ones. Um, yeah, with respect to the security uh, hacking, um, we believe that uh, an autonomous robot is more secure than a remotely pilot drone because, as I mentioned, it, it does not really require uh, the communication link. So it eventually could uh, switch off the link after you send the, the, the mission command and perform out autonomously without the need of anyone giving them commands. So we believe it's, it's more secure than a remotely pilot uh, drone. Nevertheless, it's true that there are still many opportunities to work there. Of course, uh, building a fully autonomous, very secure robot requires a huge work. And one of their opportunities is to work also on this security part. With respect to this docking station for autonomous flights, I, I heard about many projects trying to do this. And it was uh, really, for me, it's very interesting. And uh, I believe this is part of the future. Uh, we will have docking stations all over the cities, uh, all over the space in general, the, the environment, with drones there that can perform autonomous missions, for example, uh, for monitoring fires in the forest, for package delivery, um, for communication relay. I, I have this view. <laughs> Thank really you very much nice. for your answer. Thank you for your presentation. Thank and you now let's talk about an alternative method for condition assessment in all mines with drone. And we are going to talk about it with Ralph Morrison from Fraunhofer IZFP. Uh, Ralph, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um, First of all, I must apologize at the beginning. Um, my uh, voice is a little, little bit weak, and, and my English is not it's not so good. So um, I hope that will be uh, I will be understood in the next few minutes. Um, okay, today I would like present to one of aspects um, of our work in drone project. Um, yeah, UV with ultrasound in contact technology. Sounds strange, um, but it's an but it's an old old question for us. Uh, um, our institute or the, um, our yeah our institute has been working in the field of material testing since 1972. And uh, we have uh, carried out the first test of condition assessment with UAVs at uh, 2009. So uh, that we saw the, this project as an opportunity to work together uh, with partners and open questions in building diagnostics. Therefore, we have uh, choose uh, to, uh, the, this old question for us. Uh, in the main, um, yeah, operators of, uh, yeah, operators, owners of industrial plants 
um, must be checked their infra infrastructure regularly. Most uh, all um, three years at a, um, um, all all three years uh, in in the in interval. Um, in the most case, um, uh, is are there um, tests um, um, close to the to hand? Also, um, the inspection guide uh, has the probe in the, in your hand and must be uh, tools uh, to um, check up or to to work up into the building. On um, that that is um, in many in many uh, yeah in many uh, faults uh, yeah difficult to access um, to post or uh, and 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 build and risk to um, the um, and build in risk to to the personnel. So, so we 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 have uh, uh, um, so we have this this, this question, and um, uh, this question is: um, It is possible to perform a handheld ultrasonic testing to a um, with a UV to avoid dangerous assessment of the testing personnel, uh, and in order of the limit complexity of this task. We have us concentrated on a small aspect of the structural testing. The examination uh, in this, of the stability on the base of corrosion assessment. Uh, in, in particular, we have picked out um, the wall thickness testing of steel components in, in uh, old, old uh, mining areas. Uh, to the right, um, you see an um, an, an old uh, um, uh, um, <coughs> um, an old um, mining complex uh, from the 1963 um, and uh, it is uh, we all all um, uh, coal mines in the region is closed but uh, the owner must be uh, saved your own structure Therefore, also for the for the project, uh, is is the task or the the, the target or the objectives objectives uh, um, the material condition. Now, near hand uh, testing and integration um, a test head uh, or the manipulation unit into a UAV. The wall sick test, uh, the wall sickness measurement with ultrasound uh, is uh, in there. Um, in their uh, norm or uh, in in their standard uh, DIN EN um, uh, uh, um, uh, descri describe description. Uh, <clears throat> in the next, or the first step, yeah. In the first step, we approached. Um, we concentrated. Um, we approached. Uh, we we we, uh, we we focused on us on the inspection process, the first step. Uh, uh, but uh, how is the environment condition? Um, how uh, how how must be contact pressure uh, on the probe? Uh, and and uh, we can we stabilize the um, the UOV in the near of the structure uh, in the fly and in the contact. With the building. Uh, um, in, the, in the next step, we concentrated uh, we concentrated on the equipment of the UV wish uh, to be equipped according for impl implementation. You you see the picture uh, on the right. Uh, this is the basic structure of the UV. Uh, you have uh, an, an ultrasound electronic uh, with the with a Prezzo probe for the measuring or for the inspection, and uh, um, uh, decided from from that the only the uh, the only the, the flight con flight system uh, um, uh, to the UEV. We haven't uh, in this case. 
no no connect to, uh, to the uh, between uh, both systems um uh the first the uh, um uh, the, the first, uh, what we, um, uh, the, um, in the first approach, we assumed the particular automation motion sync, uh, sync automated motion uh, sequences uh, in equal um, the remote control pilot and uh, um, uh, is support by the flying electronics. In the in the classic areas of the flight stability and control, the material testing uh, should be not carried out by the pilot but uh, by an uh, operator. Uh, we carried we carried uh, um, this this uh, or, uh, this project in many in many iterative uh, steps. Uh, you have seen the first, uh, the big step, uh, the first and the second step. He has the third, uh, he has uh, the third step, the frame. An example for the, for the frame steps. Uh, uh, we have the beginning, we have beginning um, with an, we, yes, we started with, with a radar light, but an also technical limited system. In the left picture, it's a DJI frame. Uh, um, uh, with uh, an hexacopter kit, but it's soon reachable and technical limits uh, due to low pilot uh, payload. We have uh, um, uh, any, any, uh, many, many, uh, um, many um, uh, changes on the frame uh, work. But last, uh, it, it was too small for uh, all our um, uh, ideas. Uh, there so, um, therefore, in a second iteration step, we decided us for a massive frame uh, to uh, show it in the red, in the, in the right pictures. Um, um, and here, um, in the front, in the front of uh, the UV, you have seen, you seen the the U ultrasonic probe. Uh, here, here is the um, uh, ultrasonic electronic and the, the coupling um, material, and uh, the, the rest of the um, the rest of the UV is an um, frame, also a building frame. Uh, from uh, 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 any distributors, um, we used uh, we used here um, DJI DJI motors um, uh, E12 E1200 with uh, 17 uh, uh, inches propellers. The last the last uh, concept or the last. Uh, the actual um, frame uh, do you see in, in the right uh, picture uh, above uh, um, uh, down um, we have we have uh, to fix a, um, a stability problem on the um, uh, on the building uh, with uh, any uh, um, with uh, um, tri uh, to contact to contact uh, um, the um, two additional contact uh, on the on the probe. Yeah, the red I'm elements. I'm so sorry, but we need to move uh, to the conclusion because time. Yeah, is it's passed. it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, yes, uh, we have also um, the, our um, the proof of the concept. We have been. Um, more as one flight uh, in the building and the building uh, here um, here's one picture or here's a one video for the last for the last uh, um, uh, um, flights you have seen it it works it, it works on on this other side but is uh, therefore is many many problems um, for the um, yeah, for the for the um, uh, construction. Yeah, um, um, therefore, um, uh, yeah, the contact force 
uh, on the, the primary contact force at the UOB can apply it in uh, to the structure is low and and that make the inspection very very uh, strange that was that was for me um i hope i uh, i hope you can't make, can't me understand yes th thank you Any for questions? the presentation um I think we have a question from Virgil Doge from Loria. Yeah. Uh, I guess that the, one of uh, the main issue of uh, the project is the control of the, the UAV, because uh, yeah. UAV uh, with pushing against a wall is not like the common use of UAV. And uh, have you considered using uh, like non-standard UAV? Because you, there is some prototypes where uh, propellers are not just like uh, in sandar shape and they are like uh, opposing each other. So you can control your UAV in like six degrees of freedom or something like that, instead of the normal way of controlling it. In the UAV uh, works a simple, simple uh, flight controller from DJI. Uh, it's and the frame is a big frame uh, from the from a uh, distributor in, in Bavaria. The next step that that we will will go um, uh, is uh, or the, the next two steps. Um, the second um, we must fly uh, to semi autonome to the inspection point. Yeah, also that is that is one of our ideas, and uh, and the piezo technology uh, to the um, inspection is uh, not not really not uh, uh, yeah not, not not so good uh, on uh, for the for this um, yeah for this uh, environment uh, for for this environment. Thank you, Ralf. Um, so, very interesting uh, subject um, developed uh, with uh, other partners in uh, the, the GRUN project. And now let's go further on uh, the subject of uh, drone development for indoor applications with India Nguyen, an electronic engineer from Vietnam and software specialist, head of robotics at Copta System. Yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, so uh, my name is Nguyen. I'm uh, head of robotics from uh, Copta System. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, in my topic, I will uh, show some latest development prog progress from our research team about UAV development for indoor applications. So we, we start with the, with the questions from our industrial partners of how can we inspect a uh, abandoned mine or underground tunnel because it's too dangerous to send human there. And it's, it's, um, so, we have to fly a copter inside a tunnel. So how can we do it safely, but still achieve the task? So in my presentation, I will show you the, the goal of our development, the challenges and our solution for that. So first, uh, the goals of development is to develop a UV system that can enable safe autonomous flights inside indoor environment. So for indoor environments, I mean, maybe a big hall or big garage or abandoned mines or underground tunnel. So the first question is that for outside, it's easy to use GPS. So if GPS is not accurate enough for positioning, we can use two GPS, GPS RTK to achieve centimeter, centimeter level of accuracy. But if we put the drone inside an indoor environment where GPS cannot work anymore because it's rely on satellite signal, which is blocked by a building or the underground. So how the copter first know its position? So it is the question, the first question that we will solve 
in our solutions. The second thing is that how can we design a copter which is robust and can carry professional sensor equipment. So as you know that current commercial drones ready to fly like from DJI's or any other brands, they have all the advantage but also the limitation in design for integrated special equipment, especially industrial standards, which is heavy and expensive and the risk is high if there's a crash. So how to develop a safe drone but it still looks nice. So that's the two main goals for the UAV system and the copter design. And what challenge do we have for the UAV system? So at first, as I mentioned, in indoor, there's no GPS for position tracking. So the drones, I can say completely blind and don't know, and don't know where it is. And the second is that radio communication link is also not work because of the war. And this, the other problem is that in, in indoor it's more complex and more obstacle on the way. The copter have to find the way by itself. So it's not like in the outside where you can point the drone to a GPS location is easy to go there. But inside it needs to find its own way. So about copter designs, there's a high chance of collision. The environment is sometimes dark and usually dusty. And uh, we have to solve the problems when mounting professional sensor payload for specific tasks like inspection or indoor exploration, photogrammetry. So our solutions for the UAV system is to solve two questions. Where am I? So for us, we develop an indoor localization system and a mapping system so that the drone know where it is by itself without output sensor, external sensor. And the second is where should I go and how to get there? So for that, it is our developments in path planning and autonomous navigation. So the first question for where am I is we develop an indoor localization system including two different sensor inputs. The first is a 3D laser scanner as a primary loca localization source and second is the stereo camera. So this is our, one of the results of simultaneous localization and mapping system using DJI Livevox laser scanner. So as you can see, this is a result of mapping and also positioning. So you can see on the screen, it is the results of the laser scanner with in intensity. So if you see clearly uh, on the wall, you can see the texture there. So with this accuracy and high dense point cloud, but also the texture, is, it can be used for inspection tasks to, for example, see a crack in the tunnel. And the second one is for stereo camera. As, as you can see, I uh, do an experiment moving in a circle and you can see the position trips over time. So it's not as good as a laser scanner, but it's, it is the secondary system if the first system fails, the drone can fly safely, come home, and it's not completely blind. Next question is, where should I go and how to get there? So for that, we use NVIDIA, Jess and Savia as an onboard computing platform so that the drone can do all the tasks, do all the computation and pass planning by itself without external input. And so the step is that the first, it will generate in real time a 3D occupancy grid. And second, it will generate a guidance directions so that the copter know where to go. And for that, the copter need a goal. So the goal for the copter is to further explore 
an unknown environment, unknown areas, and avoid collision on the road. So occupancy maps, I mean, for example, in these pictures, you, ha you have an obstacle in, in black color, a free area in white, and an unknown area in gray. So the goal for the copter is to fly in only white area to avoid collision, but at the same time, trying to explore the gray area. So that's the general idea. And this is the example of occupancy grid map in 3D. So the copter can generate this map and updates in real time. So in case the structure change during the flights, for example, the roof collapse when copter fly in front of the copter, it can easily update and with a new map and avoid hitting collision, hitting obstacle. So with our copter, we have, we are, we are copter manufacturers, so we have the potential to customize our copter as we want to, to further fit for industri industrial sensors. So the solutions first is to design a copter with a unibody design and propeller protections and with closed cabinets for electric equipment to avoid dust coming in electric electrical equipment and avoid and give the copter a second chance if it excellent accidentally hits the the wall or obstacle on the road it can continue to fly and second one is redundancy in motor configuration and the third one is to further customize to integrate more professional payloads like a big la bigger laser scanner but in general, the copter still looks nice and has a uniform body. So for that, um, this is an example of our current design in uniform frame. You can see there's a propeller protection. So the protection not only protects the propeller from breaking, but also it can avoid when protector, uh, when the propeller may destroy after the collision. And the redundancy in, in design is that we use ACE motor in coaxial configuration. So for example, on one arm of a copter, the engine die, the remaining motor can still work as a compensation and the copter still fly normally to a safe point and not crash. That's the redundancy in motor. And there's the redundancy in sensor too. You can see stereo cameras on four sides. So if one, one side is the, the camera is broken or is blocked by an obstacle, it can still use the position results from other sensor. Yeah, so that's the general ideas of our development and the challenge if you want to fly a drone indoor, especially with expensive equipment and for the purpose of generates uh, not only point clouds, but high dense and accurate point clouds for inspection task. So thank you for your listening. Uh, if you have questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, I will ask if we have questions. Um, we have a small question from Enalux, Robin. Uh, yes, thank you and thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah, I uh, just have one question. So at the beginning, you presented the result of SLAM using live uh, LiveOx laser scanner. Okay. Is it already made? Like you can buy it from a shop or you build it by yourself? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's an interesting question. So I will... Uh open the, did you still see my screen? Uh, no. Okay, okay, it doesn't matter. So the LiveOx laser scanner can uh, generate point clouds, so it's available to buy. But uh, is there, um, I can say, uh, a raw sensor laser scanner. So uh, we develop our own SLAM solutions so that when the sensor move, 
it knows its current position and integrates to the current point cloud to generate a bigger map, but it still more it still remain the accuracy of the laser scanner itself. And uh, in addition to that, as you know, most of the laser scanner have the value of intensity. For example, if the laser light hits the wall, it reflects differently when it hits uh, a white board, for example, or a screw or um, a crack in the ceiling. So it will all come up as an image. So it's very good for in inspection task. Yeah, so I hope. Um, so in conclusion, you can bind a sensor, but the solution is uh, from ourselves. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I've got another question for you and for Copter system in general. Um, do you find uh, as a drone design, um, you, you, you build, uh, so you, you help building uh, drones and drone solutions. Um, do you find enough if infrastructure to test uh, your solutions uh, in the greater region? Do you find it easier easy to find uh, a space or uh, any any other tools uh, to help you uh, in that development yeah yeah so uh, yeah it's a good question uh, because uh, for for this intelligence drone sy system uh, it's important to test and test during the development and uh, we are working closely to our industrial partners uh, in Germany and also in near regions. So um, they are willing to uh, give us a chance to test in the real case. I, for In this case, it is underground mine, like abandoned mine, so no one's there. So uh, this is ability to test. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot. Okay, and um, now we are um, going to talk about um, quadricopter using vision to navigate indoor um, with Hervé Fresabouillet, our previous moderator professor at Central Supelec, <coughs> who is going to share his knowledge uh, with you about it. Hervé, it's yours. Thank you. Try to, to send. So you have it in in uh, full screen mode. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, so um, I will present here uh, part of the work we did in Central Superleg during the project, and it's. Uh, uh, I would like to show you videos, but it's not feasible with the the solution that we have here for the webinar. So I will I'll invite you to go to our website dedicated to drone that is drone.mes.centralsuperleg.fr. So please visit it, and you will see videos of what I'm. We'll show here on many more things. So um, the question is uh, that I will address today is uh, uh, we want to fly indoor and the, the challenge was to fly indoor with drones designed for outdoor flying. Hello. And uh, this is one of... Uh, 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 sorry, I have no issues. Uh, somebody is talking. Guys, I, uh, I have noise issues. It's okay? Yes, it's okay. Uh, I had some noise, sorry. So, um, so the point is, um, uh, we want to use uh, on-the-shelf products. We use the Bebop tube from Parrot, and it is designed for flying outdoor. And we, the challenge for us was to rely only on the on the vision. I mean, on the camera. And even if this camera is orientable, we try. We decided not to use this feature, just to have a, a fixed sensor, video sensor, and to play with it and see what we can do from it. So uh, I will show you here three of the topics that we addressed. Uh, two are from the, the research and development, and one is for teaching. So the two of the research development for the first one is aftercare mining. So the idea is to use the, t the fact that in mines the walls are textured to fly in the mines and to, to use the, the texture for detecting the optical flow. I will show you that just after. And the next is um, to, uh, to navigate in a crowded place. And here we use deep learning techniques thanks to GPUs. I will show what it is. 
and the point is to um, to navigate in a crowd and to avoid people uh, with a, a drone flying uh, indoor. The last uh, thing about we will show you is um, the a, a project for which we involve students that consists in navigating in um, in the corridors. And uh, so, so you see that? No, you see the. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, it's uh, um, so the, the project we did with, with students. Next. Uh, so first, the optical flow for navigation in uh, in aftercare mining. Uh, the optical flow, uh, for those who don't know, is an effect you have in an image where you're moving. So here, I take the, the picture of the Falcon Millennium in Star Wars. So when it gets very fast, you see the stars having this uh, divergent motion on the on the cockpit. So uh, this is what uh, optical flow is: is the velocity of pixels in an image induced by your, the fact that you are moving. So in real situation, in a car, you could get this kind of motions uh, with the car uh, driving uh, on a road. And uh, it's interesting because this is the way uh, insects uh, do fly. They they use uh, with their strange eyes. They use this uh, optical flow stuff to to regulate their flight. And it, indeed, it works not that bad. So this is what we we intended to investigate for after for flying inside the mines. And uh, to do so, we we went to uh, Ineris at Saint Maxima. They have uh, mines where you can fly in, and um, so they they welcome us there. And uh, so we, we put drones in the mines. And uh, as you can see, you see the picture of the mines. You have texture on the walls. And if you're moving ahead in that mines, you'll see pixels of the, the, the sliding on the image, as I showed for the Falcon Millennium. But of course, it's much slower. So we, we did that experiment. And we, had, uh, we are new to that. And we had poor lightning conditions. And uh, we also encountered difficulty with the fact that the image um, the, there's lots of noise uh, on the image because uh, because of the of the lightning condition, but also because of the dust that flies uh, everywhere or surrounding the drone. And so we had to clean the images to and to calculate the flow in another way. That's what is done usually. We have to develop our own flow calculation method because the the basic one it wasn't uh, wasn't good in such a condition. So this is an image you get we got when flying in the mine. It's not a bug, you see a black screen and we were very really frightened to see that because we made a lot of requirements. So we had to process the image to get the, the, the few information that was in, in there. So we get this and uh, from this we developed a technique uh, uh, con for computing the optical flow only on that horizontal line and when you, when you see the curve uh, uh, higher, um, a bit higher, it's because we detect some speed here of the pixels and so you see what it is it's better to see it on movies and we have this on the on the website so this is another uh, example from another movie that we get in the Saint Maximin, Saint Maxima mines so here the, the clean movies and the flow that we detect here the drone is, is moving uh, uh, forward and last one uh, you see we had this I show another example here you see on the left that we have more texture on the rocks and the, we can detect that the, the the pixels are, are sliding. And the last one, we used some better lightning. We, we, we cheated a bit and uh, we had better lightning conditions and the, the image were much better and the, the flow can be detected in a much better way. So uh, this was for, um, we, we, we are expecting to, to actually use that for driving, but we have to, uh, to face those uh, image processing problems and we, we quite uh, solved it and uh, some uh, further trials should, uh, needs to be made in the mines. The second topic I would like to uh, address here in my talk is uh, the navigation in crowded areas. And for that, we used deep learning and uh, GPU. Uh, I call that the GPU side of the force because in order to implement deep learning, you need to use a GPU. So what is deep learning? It's a very famous and recent technique in artificial intelligence that consists in uh, involving uh, very large neural networks with many neurons. This is the, the the kind of grids that you see on the picture and it's called deep because you have many many layers of them and the, the so it's a very complicated models and for running those models in real time you need some specific so, uh, devices which are gpus they are used for video games and image rendering but they can be also reused uh, for this kind of competition and this is what we are doing and you and we have bought some of them with, with the, the during the project and the point is, is to detect a depth map. Uh, I mean, um, 
for example, here, what you see, I don't know if you have some perturbations, sorry, on my, my screen. Okay, so here you see on the left, the, the picture, um, the picture of, a, of a, a living room, and then you see the many, many numbers of, of neurons that are stacked to process some uh, image processing. This is learning on curves here. And the, at the end, you get some kind of height map where you see the depth, uh, the, the distance from the elements in the picture to the, the camera. And this, uh, this is what is computed by these machine learning techniques. It is very hard job to do, and you can find many of them in the literature. So what we did is uh, from, um, we, uh, sorry, we use so um, an image of a drone navigating among people in a room, and we compute the death image like this. And uh, from uh, here, we applied a brain-inspired, uh, uh, retinal-inspired attentional mechanism that says, okay, here uh, it would be a uh, focus on this area, and this is where the drone should go in order to avoid people, and this is updated as people move in the room so that the drone can change its decision. So there's a dynamical system implemented here that is more, much more um, thinly visible on videos that we have. So uh, you will see also on the videos that the drone is able to fly among people, avoiding them, even if they move, even if they try to, okay, it's, it's, it has to be quite slow, but it, it's, uh, it does the job. So I invite you to, to go on our website to see the videos that I cannot show here. Last uh, subject I want to address was the uh, teaching. So uh, he, here in Centre Supélec, we have students uh, of uh, three years, uh, and um, the, this teaching concerns the, the, the second year students, and they are um, they are so they, they, are, they can experiment with drones, and the, the goal is to fly drone inside corridors and to exploit the structure of the corridors to drive the drone safely and also to make a semi-autonomous navigation. It means that they, they have to say to the drone, okay, go forward. And the image processing and the regulation of the drones handle the fact that it doesn't crash into the walls. It just uh, uh, rely on the image to actually move in the corridor uh, while the, the, the operator is, is only asking a very simple command, go forward. We have the same for training and uh, you will see that. So this is the way it works. So we have the simple command on the joystick, and then we make detection of uh, and filtering and detection of the corridors to get those uh, those edges. And from the shape of that, the students are able to regulate the position of the drone so that it it stays in the center of the corridor. And they can they can take um, they can take U turns. They can uh, take corridors on the left turn. And here is a, an image of the the fact that they can also across open doors to, to, to enter in an office and they, they, they only say, okay, do I want to, to cross the, the next door on the left and then the drone uh, takes in hand the, the behavior. So this is, a, this is a signal processing and automation uh, work and the, the, the students have also to integrate all this in a real uh, flying platform and this is uh, very interesting for, for them. So that's it. Uh, just mentioned for conclusion that it was uh, quite, uh, we were rather used to robots at the beginning of the project and we, we entered the, the drone subject and it was quite a hard job. We had surprises, for example, in the mines where we got black pictures, but indeed it was quite uh, quite fun and uh, we are very happy to, to participate to this project. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Hervé. And I, I like the Star Wars references. Um, we have I think we have three questions for you. The first one is uh, from uh, Rin. Uh, yes, uh, so thank you, uh, Hervé, for this presentation. It was really very interesting. So my question is, uh, you are estimating depth maps using uh, camera, monocular camera. Uh, so why didn't you use uh, directly a camera which uh, can uh, allow you to detect the depth map directly? So this is my first question. And uh, my second question is using this depth map, uh, can you generate three deep on cloud uh, with your uh, estimated uh, depth map? So thank you. Okay. Okay, so the, for the first question, uh, we, the idea was to use the drones from Parrot and to take them on the shelf and to use them as they are. On, as, on these drones, they are only a single 
camera, we use a single camera. Uh, some other uh, works that are done in the project to, to design drone specifically for this kind of purpose. This wasn't our point. We want to, to we are in research and development uh, attitude, so we want to want it to see, uh, let's take, let take the drone as it is and see what we can get from it. Because when we, you're looking on the video, as human, you're able to, to somehow navigate. Uh, so, so the idea was, uh, in some kind of artificial intelligence approach to, to, to see if we can do the, the same with the automatic system. So it was a constraint that we fixed for us. And of course, if we were to design efficient method for, for tomorrow, we would rather rely on computer, uh, on uh, skills like the, the ones of Copter Systems or other partners to, to implement very dedicated stuff that are robust. So here we are rather in a research uh, approach and this wasn't a, but you, uh, this was a choice from us. And the second question about the, the fact that we can use the we can use the, the depth map as a 3D um, to, to, to reconstruct 3D point clouds. Uh, indeed, we've tried this, but the, the point is that it's not so accurate as um, laser, le, 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 the point clouds that we had from the, from the, how you call that, the, the laser scans on the, the LIDAR on all these tools are much more accurate about the measure of the metrics. Here with deep learning, um, once again, it's not easy to, to get a single image and to retrieve the depth map, but the point is that you, you, you get only qualitative results. It's enough for us to detect where the drone has to jump to avoid people. It's enough for us, but the, for having better measurements as what we've seen just before, it's I think for the moment, as far as I know, I'm not, I'm not the one who, who realized the study of uh, the deep learning, but as far as I know, it's not um, accurate enough to, to replace a laser scan. And I have to tell that um, it requires a lot of computation because we, indeed, when a drone is flying and we compute that, we send the image to our GPU cluster that processes it, not learning, only processing it after once learning has been done. And then we, we send the result to the, to the drone. And this, uh, this has a frame rate of about uh, five hertz. So it's quite a lot of processing. Uh, uh, so with laser scans, uh, many things are, are, even if it's, it requires processing, many things can be done electronically uh, on the devices themselves. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that there are two more questions, but I'll let you answer in the, in the chat to those questions because to, to keep uh, the schedule, we are going to, uh, give the floor to the last Thank you. presentation. Thank you, Hervé. So uh, our last uh, uh, presentation is with Virgil Doge, a PhD student in computer science in Loria. Welcome, Virgil. Uh, he's inspired by robotics and its various applications. And he's going to introduce uh, us to a positioning system. So the floor is yours. OK, so hello, everybody. So uh, I will uh, introduce today the work we did uh, in the Grown project. So uh, I'm in Loria, uh, Nancy, and I was working with Sylvain and Laurent. And uh, we were working about the, um, the part about um, mining survey. So uh, in that particular context, we developed uh, nomadic and accurate positioning systems. So uh, as many of uh, previous presenters uh, stayed, um, said before, uh, UAV's uh, navigation and exploration is not easy. And uh, especially in a uh, condition where you cannot have GPS or uh, access to like uh, globally localized uh, data, so uh, it, it is the case, uh, obviously, in uh, mining environments, and uh, uh, there is also a lot of uh, dependency on the environments, as Hervé just showed uh, before. Uh, the lightning conditions are not quite good, and they are depending on like the position in the mine, so uh, there is several uh, portions of the mine where were uh, very well lighted, but some of them are uh, just uh, complete dark. So uh, the, the environment can change a lot depending on the application. So we developed something uh, to try to avoid uh, common, uh, common problems of uh, SLAM solutions. So 
Uh, one other uh, common problem is uh, high comput computational costs. Uh, as uh, Jose said before, uh, we need like a very uh, high end CPU or GPU to uh, be able to process all data uh, in live and uh, SLAM system are uh, required to uh, to process a lot of data to, to be able to have like a uh, position estimate. Uh, one last point is a uh, cur uh, current way of doing SLAM uh, based on cameras or lidars are using, uh, are estimating the position uh, according to the previous estimation. So uh, this can lead to a uh, serious drift in the uh, estimation of um, the pose over time. So when you're running very long experiments, uh, the odometry, so the estimate of the position can drift a lot and uh, you, can be, uh, you can be accurate anymore. So uh, we proposed a solution based on um, several uh, UAVs or drones or robots or whatever uh, were able to um, sense each other um, to to be able to be almost uh, totally environment uh, independent. So we don't need light, we don't need uh, texture, we don't need uh, GPS or something. And the tracking we are providing is uh, very high frequency. 250 hertz is like quite good compared to other uh, solution. So uh, that's it for the introduction. I will very uh, briefly uh, present the algorithm and how it works. So uh, as I stated before, um, there is a set of UAVs. Let's say uh, let's say uh, UAVs, and uh, each one uh, can be like uh, doing a mission or uh, being static. So the whole system is based on uh, mutual sensing of UAVs. So at some point in the, the time, uh, if you stop the, the experiment, you need to have one fixed UAV. So every UAV can move, but uh, at a given time, one must be uh, static to uh, be able to locate uh, accurately the others. But it's, uh, as you will see later, it's not uh, a big issue when you need to do a real mission like uh, some meaning process or something because uh, often you have like uh, a robot who is not moving uh, at all because he is performing something or um, doing some uh, practical stuff on the mining and uh, others can just localize him uh, yeah well I already presented the, the concept so you can basically it's like positioning system but uh, with additional beacons uh, it seems in spite of uh, what uh, land surveyor are using so uh, i don't know if you've, you're familiar with those uh, techniques but uh, they are like measuring distance on each other and they are able to to get uh, accurate position over time uh, uh, another point here is we are not only giving the position, we are on, uh, also giving the attitude of the drone. So we, we know where he is oriented on the, the space. So it's quite important if you want to integrate data. Uh, we did some experiment to validate our approach uh, on real uh, world. So I will present them now. So we used um, a static motion capture system with uh, basically used mostly for um, capturing actor uh, during uh, uh, cinema or cinematic movies or something. So, uh, so actor are, are uh, playing a scene or something and uh, this system can uh, acquire their motion quite accurately. So, uh, and we, uh, at the same time, we estimate, uh, we were estimating the position by, uh, with our system. So, um, I will show you the result of the comparison of the ground truth and uh, what we think, we, uh, where we were thinking we are. So uh, to mimic uh, real cost scenario and in a like closed space because the capturing space uh, of our uh, flying cage is quite uh, small. We, we had to simulate uh, it by uh, several moves. 
So it's just basically we did uh, several data set and uh, each data set is um, correspond to a use case scenario. So here, uh, maybe we can pass this, we, we don't really care. Uh, that one is important. Uh, you, you can see uh, our estimation in blue and uh, in, um, in orange, the ground truth, so the, the best of our knowledge of the, the pose at any given time. And what you can see here, it's, uh, it's not uh, deviating a lot. So we are quite um, accurate on the estimation of the position. So here it's a top-down view. So uh, we, we can see the whole experiment from the, the top. And here it's like the position drift. Uh, so it's the absolute position drift during uh, the whole session. So as you can see, uh, it's not drifting a lot, even after uh, long distances, like uh, 70 meters. But uh, you can also see that uh, the orientation error is not uh, that bad. It's like uh, more or less uh, 0.5 uh, degrees. So it, it's not a lot for that kind of systems. But um, another way of uh, seeing those results is to uh, do a QT style analysis. The, the, basic, uh, the basic way of doing that is just taking like a very long pass and to split it into uh, smaller ones. And for each uh, virtually created smaller pass, you uh, do some analysis on the translation error and uh, on the yo error. So as you can see, our uh, error is quite low and um, uh, it's actually better than uh, what is uh, of the state of the art in SLAM. So uh, this is like just raw result of uh, what we're doing, but uh, I will show you a practical use case uh, to demonstrate the accuracy of, of uh, the system we developed during uh, this ground project. So here is the latest uh, experiment we did. Uh, we did it yesterday, so it, it's quite uh, young, but uh, it took us a almost 30 minutes to complete the whole uh, scanning process. And uh, we were able to retrieve uh, a lot of points, as you can see here. So here, uh, what's it important to say? It's just like we are taking raw data from the LiDAR and we are uh, just translating uh, the raw data in, with our pose estimate without doing any filter or something. It, it's almost instantaneous. Uh, you, you can do it uh, online and you can save all your points uh, without much computation. So, and you can, of course, do some computation later to have a better model. So, uh, for those who already uh, went to Loria, you can maybe uh, recognize uh, the main corridor. But the fact is, it's quite weird to see it that way because we are seeing like the inner walls, but from an outer point of view because we did the scanning from the inside. Um, another uh, view, uh, interesting view of uh, our result is the top-down view, because uh, here the important part is there is almost to no uh, deviation um, during the, this pass. Um, uh, I don't know uh, actually exactly how long this uh, floor is, but it's actually something like 100 meter or, or more. And you can see that uh, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, accurately rounded. So here you, you can see a lot of uh, thing you can see as noise, but uh, those parts are just like um, other uh, rooms with uh, windows on the main, uh, on the main uh, room. So you can, you can see them, but we did not have the key to all rooms, so we, we were not able to scan every uh, room of the, the lab. So it's a result, but here uh, you can see the, the wall uh, point cloud, and uh, I have also a more detailed one. So uh, I was talking about the rooms uh, in the main corridor, so you can see them, and you can even see uh, at some points uh, like the paper, um, 
paper on the, the glasses or something like that and the windows and um, so it's it's quite accurate and here it's only point cloud so it's not made for uh, a human to to watch directly it's very useful because it's geometric data so um, for a robot it's very useful but for us it's not that nice or something but it's one of the use case uh, in in our uh, with our system we, we can use a lot of sensors we can imagine doing photogrammetry or other stuff and we can also uh, track uh, drones or uh, robots with uh, any mission like uh, Ralph uh, Ralph um, uh, sensor um, I don't know uh, it was Ralph um, uh, experimentation on a mine or something. Uh, we can track any drone for any mission, and we are not drifting uh, a lot. So that can have very accurate result, like the one you you can see now. So uh, to conclude, uh, for uh, most mission, uh, we need uh, for aerial swarms or only maybe one or two, uh, not even swarms. But you, you need the accurate pose estimation if you want to drill somewhere in your mine. You want to be sure what you're, where you're drilling. And it's even more true if you're drilling in a building because you don't want to drill on uh, water sewage or something. And um, so you need to be accurate. And you on, not only be, need to be accurate on uh, short term, but you, you need to be uh, accurate in long time. If you want to drill some something at one kilometer, you need to, to be a, a little bit accurate, at least. So uh, to summarize our approach is inspired from land surveyors. Uh, so it's basically a machine capture system with uh, mobility uh, ability so uh, it can have like the same accuracy of motion capture system but uh, you can move it over time so you can follow your drones you can and you can do everything uh, like autonomously and uh, what we what our experiments uh, succeed to show it's um, uh, the accuracy of our positioning system is uh, way better than like state-of-the-art SLAM solutions, and we don't have much drift. And one other point is we tested it in different environments, like where where there is no light, or uh, there is a lot of light, or there is light, uh, there is window where uh, reflecting light, or some a lot of stuff. And we don't have to uh, change a single parameter to to run it in. Uh, uh, in an other environment. So uh, if, for instance, I want to map my own room now, uh, I just don't have to, to do anything. I just have to, to launch the process and it will be okay. I don't have to tune everything and uh, I don't have to uh, do any work on images or something. It will work out of the box. But after that, if you want a better uh, accuracy or, f or a, a, a nicer result, you, you can still uh, use um, common techniques to to let's say filter the the point cloud or something but uh, the whole point of those experiments was to show that uh, our produced uh, 3d model is uh, very good even without any uh, any uh, processing thank you so really. that's all from me thanks for um, your attention we, we we're gonna we're gonna move to uh, I've seen that there's one question. Him, if it's a small question, you can ask it. Him? Uh, it's, yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Virgil, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your work. So my question is, you are, uh, what about uh, working in an uh, indoor place where there are mirrors? Uh, what about the quality? Uh, what is the issues you, you meet when there are mirrors in, in the indoor uh, place? So uh, I can say about uh, mirror directly. We we don't test with mirror mirrors, but uh, with windows, uh, it's working quite well. We have some reflection due to the li to um, the lidar. But uh, what we need to assess here is to say there is two different problems. So um, there is a pos positioning system. So this one will work quite well with uh, mirrors. 
because uh, uh, during the refraction process, uh, the the laser will uh, change, and we we can like uh, verify that the laser we are receiving is not coming from unknown reflections, and um, so the pos the positioning will work. But the the fact is uh, the scan, so the lidar will maybe not be able to see uh, or more accurately to know that uh, it's not like a, a real uh, wall uh, at twice uh, the distance it's on your mi uh, mirror but uh, that's two different points i think like uh, maybe in a full mi uh, mirror room it will be difficult to use it because uh, they will have too many signals in all directions but that's kind of extreme scenario and uh, uh, if there is only one mirror in the room, it's, it will work okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So now I uh, give the floor to him to conclude um, our webinar today. Yes, uh, so thank you, uh, Emily, for uh, the moderation of this session. Uh, we have now come to the end of the conference, in fact. Uh, please note that a recorded version of this webinar will be available on our GRON website with two languages, with French and uh, German traduction. So I want uh, to thank a lot all our partners and our moderators for their presentation, patience and participation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Thank you for attending. Bye.